Welcome to this Brügel event. My name is Guntram Wolf and I'm the director of Brügel and I'm pleased to host today a discussion with the governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, Gabriel Maklouf. Uh, governor Gabriel, welcome to our event. Thank you for, for being here. Uh, we want to discuss today um, about um, macro prudential tools for market-based finance and uh, for a market-based finance sector and what kind of lessons from COVID-19. So I think a lot of discussion, of course, has been uh, on the banks uh, recently, um, but perhaps less uh, discussion has been on uh, non-bank-based um, non uh, finance, so market-based finance, essentially. Um, and we are delighted that you could make it and join us for this discussion today um, on this um, uh, on this online event. Now, um, in, uh, for completeness, um, let me, uh, of course, say that um, if you would like to um, ask questions in the audience, those of us, uh, of you who watch this uh, online conference, please go on Slido and type in markets. Markets is the password um, or the code for the conference. And you are free to enter your questions and remarks um, on Slido and we will look at them in a bit. Um, last but not least, of course, uh, uh, let me also welcome Maria de Merzes, Brügel's Deputy Director, um, who will uh, to get today we, uh, uh, have the conversation together uh, with me, uh, with the governor. Um, governor, thank you again so much for, uh, for joining. Um, let me perhaps uh, throw the first um, question at you. Um, could you perhaps begin by setting the scene um, on some headline numbers uh, so that we, uh, our audience gets a sense of the scale and the recent growth of market-based finance? Well, firstly, um, can I say thank you for the invitation to join this seminar? Um, I haven't done many of these um, uh, web-based virtual uh, things. Uh, no doubt you've done many, but I realize that this is the future. Um, so I have to now get used to this. Um, the future has arrived far quicker than we expected, but there you go. Um, let me just, uh, in responding to your question, um, just remind uh, everybody um, uh, something which I'm sure they're all aware, but we are in the middle of an unprecedented shock um, which um, in many ways is, well, it's certainly the greatest challenge to the financial system since uh, the great, uh, the global financial crisis. Um, but it's also, I think, a challenge to economies and communities throughout Europe and throughout the world. And um, we are uh, slowly emerging from the depths of the economic impact but uh, I'd hesitate to say that we can see uh, the end of this crisis right now. Uh, but certainly we started to learn uh, some lessons already in my view. Um, uh, and one of the things I think uh, we have learned is, and I'll probably be coming back to this during the course of this seminar, is that the efforts that we made um, over the last decade to strengthen the financial system, particularly in respect to banks, have actually paid off. All those efforts have worked. The resilience of the system to the to what has been, uh, as I said, an unprecedented and a very severe shock. Um, the system has shown resilience at this early stage. Um, so uh, I think that's an important piece of context to. to uh, to uh, bear in mind, which brings us to uh, your question and specifically around market-based finance. I mean, one of the other characteristics of the last 10 years is as our focus uh, was put on the banking sector and strengthening uh, banks, uh, what we saw was a growth in um, market-based finance. And we know that um, certainly since the global financial crisis, the world's market-based finance sector has more than doubled in size. It was around um, 43 trillion euro in 2009. 
it had got to about 57 trillion in 2012 and to over 100 trillion in 2018. And certainly in Ireland, um, non-bank financial institutions now account for approximately 40% of total assets of the overall um, no, sorry, that's, um, that's at a euro area level, I beg your pardon, at a euro area, area level, um, non-bank financial uh, institutions account for 40% of total assets of the overall euro area financial sector. Um, growth's been slower than uh, elsewhere than in the United States by and large, um, but it's still been significant. So they're, they amounted... Um, to around 35 trillion euro at the end of 2019, having been about 20 trillion um, at the end of 2009. And in Ireland, which is the point I was going to make um, just now, uh, they've more than doubled. Market-based finance sector um, has more than doubled from 1.8 trillion euro at the end of 2009 to over 4.5 trillion at the uh, uh, in the first quarter of this year, um, and particularly for Ireland, um, the sector is around uh, thirteen times the value of the economy uh, measured by GNI Star. Um, it's uh, twenty-two times, but by GDP, it's thirteen times, and that's compared with. Um, uh, 2.8 times in the euro area and about one and a half times in the US. So it is a very significant part of our economy. Uh, and we find ourselves the sixth largest jurisdiction uh, in the world for non-bank financial intermediation activities. Um, and the third largest in the euro area for market-based finance is behind um, Luxembourg and the Netherlands. Um, so the sector has grown in, in recent years, um, and it's now a very important part of um, financial intermediation. Um, and uh, uh, the fact that it's so important means that the potential disruptions um, in the sector will have a more material impact than uh, they would have had a decade ago. Uh, if I may, I mean, uh, you, you talked, uh, um, Gabriel, about the resilience of the system after all the efforts we made in the past 10 years to uh, reform the banking system to arrive at the result of now a much more resilient system. But actually, some of the numbers you quote are actually really quite big. Have we just shifted the risks maybe from the banking system to the non-market, uh, um, non-bank finance system to the market-based system? But to a certain extent, I think that is what's happened. Um, yeah. To a certain extent, I think the um, the focus on banks and the, the absolutely justified focus on banks um, has uh, led to uh, the growth in um, uh, non-banks and to market-based finance. I think, uh, on the other hand, I also think that if you look at um, just the differences between the United States and the Euro area, um, we are, you know, we are more banked in Europe compared to the US. And to a certain extent, I think um, the, uh, the advantages that we see from uh, market-based finance in, in the sense that it, um, you know, it obviously provides finance to uh, other parts of the financial system. It provides finance uh, to the real economy, but it also helps in um, uh, in facilitating risk sharing. So I think some of these trends um, would likely have happened um, over the last decade. I suspect the uh, very big focus on banks and banks alone may have helped to accelerate uh, some of the shift to, um, to non-banks. But the, um, the substantive answer to your question is that uh, we now need to focus on the non-bank uh, 
sector, non-bank financial intermediation and market-based finance, and look really hard at what risks we may have, uh, we, we may see um, uh, arising there, whether they were caused by the, whether they were simply a set of risks shifted or whether they're just a new set of risks. I was wondering if you could perhaps tell us a little bit more, what do you mean by market-based finance? Are we really talking about then the shadow banking system or are we talking about you know, pure capital markets? If you could give us a little bit a sense of what we mean um, uh, by market-based system, it's also an, a, it would be an important ingredient for us for understanding the risks, uh, how they might be coming and what type of regulation we might want to sort of think about uh, uh, putting in place in the future. Sure, I mean, um... Investment funds, uh, money market funds, um, we've, uh, those are probably the most immediate ones that, uh, that come to mind because that is also particularly important for, um, for Ireland. Um, so it includes uh, uh, shadow banking, um, but essentially for me that it is, um, uh, almost anything that involves non-bank financial intermediation and the scale of what we see in investment funds, for example, in, uh, in Ireland um, and money market funds. I mean, that, that's particularly significant for us. It'll be different, I suspect, in some other jurisdictions. Um, but uh, mm. what, what it, it, in many ways, the, the important thing for me is the extent to which um, this is financial intermediation that's not uh, covered um, um, by the, and we're gonna, I mean, I'm coming on to my, the main theme of uh, what I've been uh, talking about, I will be talking about, which is the need for a macro prudential framework that covers that sector. Um, mm. So it's uh, it's big, I think, is the bottom line here. But can yeah. we? I mean, can we? Uh, I mean, perhaps before uh, before talking about the policy side, uh, just sort of um, finish. Um, sort of assessing uh, the sector and you know wh where the sector is at this stage i mean so you so you describe the resilience of the banking system and how the banking system has really kept up so far i think we might still see some trouble in the banking system later on in the year as npls uh, feed through um, uh, the non-performing loads feed through to the balance sheets of banks but uh, but uh, what about the uh, so the the market based finance or stock markets the bond markets um, uh, you know uh, you defined it very much from the player side but I mean you can also define it from the product side right I mean stocks and bonds and and and, and other uh, market based uh, solutions for financial intermediation and how ha have they really uh, dealt with the shock of COVID nineteen so far. I mean, what's yeah. uh, what's the, what's your assessment of um, this this part of financial intermediation um, uh, and the way they have dealt with the shock? Well, uh, what we saw um, in March, and March is the sort of uh, key month uh, for uh, for this. Um, we saw financial market turbulence and a you know, a flight to safety um, with uh, heightened demand for cash uh, sweeping through uh, markets at the start of the shock. Uh, the fund sector experiencing a sharp increase in uh, redemptions. Um, outflows were particularly uh, acute in funds um, invested in corporate bonds. Um, in the case of high yield bond funds, for example, outflows as a percentage of total assets under management were the highest since the financial crisis. And we saw quite a deterioration in corporate bond market um, liquidity. Um, I mean, in Ireland, um, we published our financial stability review two weeks ago. In, in our Irish resident funds 
in March saw around 72 billion euro of net redemptions. Um, so what, what we saw in March essentially was that uh, funds of exposures to less liquid assets um, were particularly susceptible to outflows. Um, and as a share of assets under management, redemptions were highest among corporate bond yields. Um, especially less liquid and high yield uh, corporate bonds. Um, and but one of the things that was it's also interesting is that um, redemptions from funds were not sort of necessarily correlated with asset returns. Um, so equity price falls were much larger than falls in corporate bond um, prices. Um, as a share of assets under management funds, equity, equity funds experienced much smaller redemptions compared to corporate bonds. Um, so, uh, I mean, that's the general picture. That is the, the nature of the equity uh, fund, Roy, right? I mean, by definition, almost that should happen. It's a less, the redemption rates are less volatile, right? I mean, there is, a, I, mean, I don't want to use the word commitment, but there is, there is a sort of more dedication to, to equity once you hold equity than once you, you hold corporate bonds. So that's perhaps not surprising, right? Um, um, but, but I mean, I think that's, uh, that's actually the, um, the, the interesting part of this conversation is uh, you know, the future of, of equity in, in Europe. I mean, if I may link this a little bit to the, to the CMU agenda, um, I mean, yeah. we have had many years of talk, certainly in the Euro area, about CMU and about developing much more of the capital market side of, of, of this. Uh, and, and, well, dare I say, we haven't really made much progress. And yet some of the numbers that you're quoting are actually quite big. I thought... They are, we have actually made progress in developing sort of non-bank finance, even if it's not entirely of the uh, of the capital of the of the equity side. Um, so the question is: Is this is COVID nineteen now an opportunity to give new life into this and try and move a, a little bit more away from the bank, the dependence on bank finance, or do you think that this is perhaps a natural process that was going to happen anyway, or or, or what? Well, I, I certainly think. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, I certainly think that um, Europe is, uh, very broadly speaking, uh, overbanked. Um, and um, uh, I mean, the banking sector almost certainly um, needs, a, needs some consolidation. Uh, yeah. It's obviously being challenged in some of its business models um, uh, with technology. But, um, and I think what we've seen over the last decade was a trend that was going to continue. As I said, in Europe, it's been slower than the, than, uh, than the world. Um, but uh, I think it was a trend. What, what, um, what COVID-19 has done is given us a, um, it's given us, a, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a big shock, but it's also a big test. And I think it's, it's accelerated and crystallized some of the questions um, that some of us have been uh, talking about or, uh, or posing um, in recent years. So if you, if you um, so to a certain extent, it's an opportunity. Um, I don't think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually cr created and something new and unexpected. Um, I think the direction of movement um, is still the same one. I think the pace at which we're moving potentially could change. You mentioned Capital Markets Union. My own view is um, that it will be a good thing, uh, not just for the capital markets in Europe, but actually for the European economy. Um, and uh, I, I hope we do, you know, I welcome the uh, high level forums report um, and hope the commission sort of uh, come up with 
constructive proposals to implement it all. Um, but we have traveled for a long time down this road. I just hope it, we can just uh, push along um, and uh, uh, make some progress in that direction. But perhaps we can talk a bit about um, the macro prudential aspect because um, it's in the title, not only because it's in the title of this, um, this uh, webinar, but, uh, but also because we talked about the risks and, and Maria evoked the possibility that some of the risks might have migrated from the banking system uh, to um, essentially capital markets. And you know whether or not we should we should worry, and what kind of um, regulation and macroprudential rules are really needed. I mean, obviously, um, when you compare banking with capital markets, there's huge differences, right? I mean, banking is characterized by leverage; it's characterized by maturity transformation; it's characterized by uh, deposits. Um, uh, so it's a very, uh, the banking system is a very different animal to, uh, to capital markets, um, which um, explains why it requires a very different form of regulation. But, uh, but still, um, if risks are too big in the capital markets, it spills over and may endanger the entire stability of the financial system. So now you wanted to, in the title, you really wanted to, to bring forward this aspect of macroprudential um, uh, regulation and macroprudential rules. Um, perhaps you can just enlarge what is your uh, key point you want to make here. Sure. Um, I mean, if I could just go back to the um, the one of the impacts that we saw back in March was that we did see some spillover effects in um, uh, impacting on on government bonds. We saw impacts on Treasury. U.S. Treasury bonds, right? So it's not as you know these challenges um, that we saw in March did not simply stay very contained in uh, in invest you know in money market funds or corporate bond funds. They actually there were some spillover effects. Um, I take a slightly different uh, perspective to you in the comparisons between banking sector and market based finance because I think some of the fundamental challenges that we see uh, faced by banks in times of crisis are precisely the ones that we worry about with market-based finance. We worry about um, uh, excessive leverage. We worry about liquidity mismatches. Um, uh, they are, uh, I think they're very similar. Um, and I think the challenges are very similar. Um, so for me, I think in terms of what we do, uh, I, I think there are three things that we need to be doing. I mean, we absolutely, firstly, need to learn the lessons of what happened in March. Secondly, well, we do need to develop and operationalize a macro prudential framework for market-based finance. I'll come and talk, talk about that in a minute. Um, and uh, thirdly, we do need to think about the costs and benefits of the sort of additional resilience that I'm proposing. Um, the, you know, I mean, firstly, what's macroprudential about? Macroprudential is about putting particular emphasis on the likely impact of correlated behavior on the part of individual financial institutions. So it, the individual, you know, back in the day, individual banks were making very rational decisions um, for them, um, but the collective of those rational decisions by all the banks cause problems. So that is essentially the behavior that I think we need to um, be concerned about in the case of market-based finance, whether it's money market funds, corporate bond funds, whatever, uh, whatever uh, they are. Um, and work in this, in this area um, as we were saying earlier, it has concentrated on in macro prudential, uh, has been focused on the banking sector, but it hasn't been completely um, uh, silent in market based finance. And we have, we in Ireland have been talking to uh, and working with uh, colleagues um, in Europe, um, in uh, 
uh, whether it's the ESRB or ESMA or IOSCO or the Financial Stability Board, um, there has been um, work uh, over the years, but in particular uh, recently um, in response to, to the shock. Um, and what's, what's important about that is that if you're going to have a macro prudential framework for market based finance, you do need international coordination to make it work. Um, uh, you know, we have seen some progress in recent years, but actually we need all those players that I just mentioned um, to uh, increase their efforts um, to develop a framework and, you know, and to do so together. Um, there are, there's probably three big questions that I think we should ask ourselves as we develop the framework. One, what is the right toolkit to um, target excessive liquidity mismatches and excessive leverage in the sector? Um, and work has started at the EU on that. Secondly, what's the appropriate balance between um, time varying and structural interventions? Um, and thirdly, what's the most appropriate approach to international coordination? Um, as I said, there are many groups, many countries um, who have an interest here Capital markets are, by their nature, international, um, and uh, any gaps in coverage of a new framework would would limit its effectiveness. So, uh, coordination matters. Mm. Um, and then, and then, my final, just general point is that um, the costs and benefits um, of uh, of any new framework needs, in my view, to be considered in a wider economic perspective. So when we introduced uh, the reforms of the last 10 years, there was sort of detailed cost benefit analysis done by uh, the FSB and uh, the Basel committee. Um, I think uh, we'd need to do something similar, but I think it's also important that we actually think very hard about the economy and the citizens that live in the economy and what the benefits uh, overall and costs of any new rules would have. But um, so that's what my thinking is at the moment. Um, and I have to say my, my own view right now is that, I mean, I know there are some people who have, uh, who say that we don't need, you know, because the, uh, uh, <clears throat> Because they, you know, funds and the sector basically survived um, uh, the crisis in March. We therefore don't need any new macroprudential framework. Um, I completely disagree with this view, and in, in many ways, what uh, uh, my experience of March has been, and that's not to take away from the need to study it very carefully. Uh, my experience of March has persuaded me that actually we should be uh, accelerating our efforts to develop this framework and get ahead of the curve. Uh, we don't need to wait for something to go wrong before we uh, persuade ourselves uh, we need to do something. But can I, uh, sorry, can I just push you on this last point because I was actually uh, thinking to challenge you exactly along those lines. I mean, so, so, uh, I mean, the fact that um, we've had the biggest shock uh, since World War II um, and um, uh, we are getting out of this now, but okay, I mean, we've had the biggest real economy shock since World War II and our stock markets are now basically back to where they were uh, uh, based back in uh, back last year. Um, doesn't that suggest that um, the central banks um, are there and have done enough to stabilize um, the, the the system. Or, I mean, what what really is um, is your worry? Is your worry that central bank action has been too big just to sort of in in a, in a green spend put uh, underwrite the stock markets and therefore there's too much liquidity out there and ultimately we are building 
up for the next crisis and and is that your real worry and that's why we should sort of have bigger buffers um, in the in the market so that the next time we have a one in a hundred year sh year shock, um, the, the markets cope better with less central bank intervention. Or, I mean, can you just elaborate a little bit why why your March experience suggests we need um, macro potential action on top of the central bank action that has actually happened? Yeah, uh, the th um, I've got three, I think, responses to your point. Uh, and the first one is that, um, this is a personal view, I don't pay a lot of attention to what the stock market thinks. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I, you know, I'm interested in the movements, but uh, I hesitate to say that um, the stock market, the fact that the stock market is back at levels that it was means that they're uh, much better informed uh, than I am uh, or than anyone else is in terms of uh, where the world's going. But anyway, that's a side issue. Um, I do, uh, I have two substantive points. One we've talked about, which is that um, the sheer scale and size of market-based finance compared to what it was uh, 10 years ago means it would almost be negligent for us to conclude that actually we don't need to do anything and that we should wait uh, for something to go wrong before we take action. We have learned a lot of lessons over the last 10 years of the value of our um, macro prudential framework. And I wouldn't say it's necessarily perfect, but um, it certainly made a difference. And um, uh, I think those, you know, having learned those lessons, we should be asking ourselves, uh, are they a wider application and should they be? And uh, for me, um, the answer to that is yes, they are a wider application. Um, we've learned what can happen uh, with um, uh, financial markets um, that uh, grow very big, where rational decisions are made in individual financial institutions, but where the, uh, the collective effect of those decisions um, can uh, uh, be negative. Um, so we've learned those lessons. Um, the scale of the sector is such that it warrants market-based finance sector that it warrants looking at. But my second substantive point is, um, we should not be relying on central bank action to save the, um, uh, the way the financial system works, right? Simply um, uh, saying that uh, we're gonna carry on, I mean, I'm, obviously I'm, 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 I'm presenting this in a rather frivolous way, but we're gonna carry on uh, uh, and taking the maximum amount of risk that we can, because we know that at the end of the day, central banks will turn up and save us. That's not the way to run an efficient and effective uh, financial system that produces ultimately uh, real economic benefits to the community at large. So yep. that's my response. But can I can I just then take on this point because you use it also as a criteria the the criteria of designing a regulation should be one that produces economic costs for the societal at large right yeah. um, but I wonder if we're still on a catch up uh, on a catch up uh, game in the sense that some of the developments probably in the non bank finance markets is is very much the the result of regulation of banks right so as you over regulate or regulate or over regulate banks money shifts. Uh, and it goes elsewhere. Um, and I mean, to the extent that you worry about the, uh, the implications, the risk implications of that, and you want to design a system uh, that is going to diminish those risks, can you at the same time think about optimal design methods in the sense of like, what kind of system would you like uh, to put in place uh, for finance in Europe to be amenable, let's say, to the digital economy or to uh, some of the new trends that we see that we haven't seen uh, before, for example, low interest rates for very long. Um, you know, what kind of finance, uh, reg regulatory financial system uh, would you like to put in place through your macroprudential, um, by incentivizing through the macroprudential system to try and, and, you know, meet some of the challenges of the future in terms of providing adequate finance uh, uh, in Europe? These, these are uh, excellent 
excellent questions. And if I had um, uh, if I had my menu of, uh, of options that I'd present it to you, at the moment I don't have a menu. I, I have a series of questions, some of them which I um, I mentioned earlier. Um, but I do think that um, some of the things you touched on are absolutely right. Um, we should be designing a, well, certainly we want to design a regulatory system that um, uh, promotes stability, um, that uh, uh, makes sure that the financial system in a time of crisis doesn't amplify any shock. Um, but I am also a very big believer that financial systems are there to support the real economy. That is why they exist. And um, so if we can design um, a, a macro prudential framework in a way that supports the development of the economy um, to deal with some of the challenges we're aware of, um, and the challenges we can see ahead, you know, which we, we all talk about all the time, um, climate change, um, uh, technology, uh, digital, I mean, all of these, all of these challenges. I mean, I think um, to the extent that you can design a framework to take account of those, then great. Uh, sometimes it's too hard. Uh, and sometimes what you need to aim to do is the minimum amount of harm you can to allow the development of, um, of the market, uh, to the development of the real economy uh, to proceed as, uh, as efficiently as possible. Um, so that the focus on the financial sector is just to maintain stability, to allow the financial sector and system to work in support of the real economy. Mm. Um, but I, 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 you know, I, um, I mean, I'm all in favor of, of making sure that we have a, um, a system that uh, is effective and efficient in economic terms. Um, I, uh, you know, so I do think, actually, I mean, I do think that um, one of the questions that we should be asking ourselves as we design uh, these systems is, is to simply ask, is the market itself um, working as efficiently as we would like? Um, you know, do globally systemic institutions add value, um, add welfare um, uh, benefits to the whole community, or actually do they cause us problems, downsides, and do those downsides um, uh, exceed uh, possible, possible benefits? So I think those sorts of considerations for me uh, matter. I mean, uh, we have already a few questions on Slido, but but um, I definitely have, still have two which I would like to to throw at you. Uh, you're, you're you're in control, so uh, you can you've got privilege over Slido. Wonderful. So so look, I I, I think one one uh, one question is, um, and I think you mentioned um, sort of design questions of macroprudential policies, and you mentioned. Um, uh, time bearing measures and more structural measures and uh, if I may may paraphrase this I mean they, you can also frame it as a sort of more micro uh, measures so uh, addressed at individual institutions um, forcing them to hold a certain amount of liquidity a certain amount of, of equity and so on depending on the institution obviously and then you can think of uh, sort of more uh, cyclical um, uh, measures, time varying measures, which are probably much more macro prudential. So you, so you have the micro prudential and the macro prudential uh, yeah. measures that that apply to also market based um, finance. And if you just unpack a little bit more your thinking on those, I mean, where would you um, put more emphasis at this stage? Um, what what have you what have you really learned from the COVID shock? I mean, is it? 
is it much more a sort of um, a herding problem? So everybody sort of just follows sentiments and therefore we need sort of a macro potential uh, measure or is it really something that can be addressed much better with individual um, firm specific, uh, I mean, firm regulation that, uh, that sort of starts with a specific firm uh, uh, liquidity ratios and so on and so forth. So if you can just unpack that that point, because I was intrigued by your, your remark on that. that no, I, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think it is one of the questions that needs to be uh, addressed for me in terms of the COVID shock um, what uh, one of the things I learned was certainly that it's um, it's uh, uh, the behaviour we saw really pointed towards a microprudential response. That's in terms of that particular shock. Um, but as as with all these things, including in the banking sector, you know the the, the system works through a combination of a macroprudential. Uh, set of tools and a micro prudential set of tools. So I don't think it's an either or. Um, and I think it is a question, what is the balance between uh, time varying and structural uh, interventions? I mean, a closer alignment between funds redemption profiles with the liquidity of their um, underlying assets would uh, probably address uh, structural liquidity mismatches. But we know that the pricing of market li liquidity risk by uh, participants is time varying. So, um, so it would speak to the, you know, the need to explore uh, what sort of time varying interventions. But I think that's, that's one of the qu big questions in terms of the work that's needed actually to strike that balance. I don't have a particular uh, view other than um, what, what I just said, which I don't think it's it's a question of uh, of either or uh, between the macro, pro, and the micro. Okay, and perhaps my uh, my before we go to Slido and Maria, you might also still have another question. But but of course, one question which we haven't touched, and which I think one has to ask, is is about taxation. Um, yeah. you mentioned that Ireland. Um, uh, has a non-market-based financial system of 4.5 trillion, if, if that is the number I, I heard. Um, yeah. So that's huge. Um, that's um, that's like a third of, of Eurozone GDP, something like this, in terms of assets um, uh, in Ireland. And Ireland is a, is a small country, a small part of the Eurozone, obviously. So, so I think the suspicion is that taxation and tax treatment um, drives up the sector and makes the sector so big also in Ireland. Um, any yeah. comment uh, on whether that is an issue and how to deal with that? Uh, and no, no, I, 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 think, um, I think taxation does play, does absolutely play a part in the size of the sector, but it's not the only factor. Um, I mean, I think uh, uh, other factors include um, the English language. You know, include the the uh, um, you know the externality. I suppose that the English language, uh, the positive externality that the English language uh, provides, um, it uh, and I think it attracts um, uh, United States um, firms to uh, base themselves in Ireland, um, and some of that is. Is uh, is the language, but some of it is just historical, cultural um, uh, connections between Ireland and the United States. Um, it's also to do with, uh, you know, the uh, the legal framework is to do with the quality of people that the education system provides in the country. But yeah, ta taxes are, you know, I mean, it's absolutely a a feature of all this. But I mean, I, I'd suggest that if we try and fix the tax issue, that's really beside the point of putting in place a macroprudential framework that operates ultimately across the global financial system. Yeah. 
if you allow me one last question before we go into to slide or a little bit of a, of a general question um, starting with the forecasts for the economy coming from all the institutions the IMF this be everybody mm -hmm. uh, one thing I think that we all agree on is that the uh, the the uncertainty around any of the forecast is enormous uh, to the point to the point of not being able to rely actually on, on baseline uh, scenario. You know, if, if, if that's true, if, if you, and I, I don't know that you agree, but if you agree that there is an enormous amount of uncertainty, some of which caused by trends that were happening before us, but we don't know where they're leading us. We don't know what the new steady state is going to be. Mm -hmm. And some of it changed as a result of, of COVID-19. You know, how would you design a macroprudential framework when, you know, it's not obvious where we're heading, um, yeah, you know, what kind of principles would you have to, to follow in order for a framework to be operational in an environment of what can only be thought of as, as you know, a fundamental uncertainty? Um, there's a lot packed, a lot packed in that question. Um, let me just start by, by um, addressing your point about forecasts. I mean, because there is such uh, uncertainty, um, that uh, that's why all forecasters, including ourselves, um, uh, haven't really bothered to try and make a forecast. What we've done mm. is develop scenarios uh, and say, well, if this scenario actually turns out, this is what we think will happen. So um, uh, you're right, there is a lot of uncertainty, but I think all the forecasts, all the forecasts, um, or the projections to be accurate based on these scenarios, do um, assume that uh, at some point a vaccine will be discovered and some sort of a recovery will come, right? Yeah. So we are not assuming, the world is not assuming that uh, we're on some sort of trajectory to catastrophe and uh, the end of, of, of time. So uh, the debate is really what is the depth of uh, the shock and what is the, uh, how long will this shock um, uh, last for? How long will it endure? And so we've had all these debates about V-shaped and W-shaped and uh, U-shaped and uh, in my case, a Nike uh, tick. Uh, type recovery is what I think, because I think it's going to be gradual. Um, but the point of all this is that the world is recovering. Um, the issues and the challenges that we had uh, at the end of February uh, have not disappeared. The, um, the, 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 the growth of the market-based finance sector uh, is not going to suddenly reverse. Um, so it does absolutely put challenges in how you design um, any rules and regulations in uncertainty, but it doesn't mean that you uh, don't make the effort to design those rules and regulations. And um, in many ways, you know, at the beginning, back in 2009, you could say that with a financial system sort of falling around us, um, uh, that was probably uh, the hardest moment in time to start developing uh, rules and regulations for uh, to repair the financial system. But the world did it. Um, and uh, it took us a while, but we did it. And right now, uh, the reality is, is that the financial system itself, unlike 10 years ago, the financial system itself is still standing. Um, it is not the cause of the current crisis. The cause of the current crisis is, is a health pandemic. Um, so I think uh, the job of people like me and others, and the Central Bank of Ireland is actually in a you know, relatively good position because we bring together both them. You know, we are the macro prudential authority. We're also the responsible for conduct. You know, we bring everything together. I think the world is... Um, in a position to make sure that the financial system, as it develops, um, is in the most resilient condition it can be. So sure, there's a lot of uncertainty around us, but I think there's enough uh, 
certainty for us to get on and uh, complete the uh, the operationalization of a macro pre framework for uh, market based finance. So, so, so since you mentioned um, uh, mentioned um, the uh, competences for macro prudential policies. Um, uh, one of our colleagues here on Slido, Alex Lehmann, actually asked the question, uh, as you called for more coordination uh, of, <clears throat> of um, macroprudential action, do you also support the greater pooling of competences for macroprudential policy at the level of the ECB, the European Systemic Risk Board? Um, I, um, I don't have a problem with the greater... Um, um, pooling of competencies um, or centralization, as some others would call it. I, I don't have a problem with it, but I do think, but my, my own view is that it is, it is more important to focus on the substance of the problem you're trying to fix and the policy um, options that you have to fix them before you start thinking about how you will administer and structure and organize um, that um, that regime, but I don't have I don't have a particular problem with it. But I do think that um, if you think about the uh, macro proof framework uh, for banks, um, uh, you know the, there's a combination both of um, of international coordination in the design of these, but local implementation mm. of these. Because you do need, um, certainly in the case of banks, we absolutely need local you know, accountability for the implementation of such frameworks. Um, and one of the challenges with uh, pooling competencies at the EU level is to make sure that that local accountability uh, can be exercised directly. But I, this is all about design. I don't have a philosophical um, position against, against that. Well, actually, I would, uh, I would interpret this question to be, is, is there a need for greater centralization? I mean, it's not so much whether there is, uh, uh, you know, whether, you know, one would agree to greater centralization from country to the European level. But do you think that the risks are now such uh, at least that's the way I would understand Alex's question. Are the needs now such uh, that it would pay out to centralize some of the power rather than keep it at, uh, at, at the decentralized level? Uh, that's what the way I would add. Uh... No, I think, I think it's, too, um, I think it's, it would be too early to come to that conclusion. Okay. I, I do think that the discussions that are happening, um, as I mentioned earlier, at, you know, ESMA and at to the FSB and IOSC and all these various places, they need to continue to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the focus needs to be on what's the best way of fixing the problem before you, before you get to you know, identify the problem, learn the lessons, decide what's the best way of fixing it before you decide and therefore we need some central control of it. I, I, I think you know, history of... Um, you know, history tells me that we could probably spend uh, 10 years designing um, some new central sort of system uh, and leave the substantive um, uh, policy challenges uh, alone. And I, th I think the balance mm. should be the other way around. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I think that's a debate we can have for a long time. I mean, I personally take the other the other view side of the view. Uh, um, I, I think actually institutions really matter, and you know the way something is institutionally designed um, has a huge impact on the actual outcome of the policies. And one of the reasons why uh, we we probably have made so little progress in really integrating our capital markets, in my view, is also related to the relatively uh, weak uh, position that ESMA um, has. I mean, ESMA has very limited supervisory powers uh, and has uh, therefore relatively limited uh, European powers. And I mean, we've made that point with my colleague, Nicolas Veron, um, uh, 
at an informal ECOFIN. And, you know, I, I do think sort of the, the value of creating an institution and let that give the institution a mandate to actually think about this from a European point of view. Um, I think there, there is really a lot of benefit. Um, but if I may, there is one more um, question that I definitely from the audience want to, uh, want to ask you. And that's from David Henry Doyle um, from Standard Poor's. He's asking, given the growing, and it's related to what we just discussed. So given the growing role of Ireland in market uh, financial intermediation, should Dublin now have a seat at the FSB table um, along with Hong Kong and Singapore? Perhaps you can say a word about, about also the global dimension of um, FSB at the FSB. Well, um, we do uh, participate in uh, FSB working groups, um, but if we were invited um, to be at the table, um, I'd, be, uh, I'd be delighted to accept. <laughs> okay, so you're yeah, in favor. Uh, <laughs> 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 Wonderful. So, so Maria, I mean, I think there's, a, of course, um, two other questions. I think one we covered by Mr. Anonymous on the size. Uh, is there a limit to the size of central bank intervention and asset purchases before inflation worries kick in? I mean, that's perhaps a nice one still, which we haven't covered. So we have uh, two more minutes. But perhaps you want to say something. Are you are you getting worried uh, about um, ECB central bank intervention? Are we doing too much? Is the inflation uh, risks coming up, um, or is that all uh, sort of a very Germanic uh, view of the world um, that uh, you know really um, uh, uh, is not not appropriate? Um, there's nothing wrong with Germanic views of the world. <laughs> Good <laughs> compliment there, <laughs> um, No, I think you no. Know, we are we are in absolutely exceptional times uh, right now, and um, in the governing council, we're having um, and have had a uh, very uh, careful, um, considered, and long discussions as to. Uh, what is happening in the economy uh, of the euro area and what actions uh, should we be taking? Um, and I think that the, the, I think where, where we are is uh, proportionate um, to the challenges that we face. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that Christine uh, Lagarde and, um, uh, and other colleagues have said is that we're ready to do whatever it is that we need to do to deliver on our mandate. Um, which actually reminds me that we started the year uh, launching a review of our strategy. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to when we come back to it. But we, we uh, haven't had the chance to really focus on, uh, on that. Um, but I, I'm not... Uh, I think the actions we've taken have been appropriate and timely. So, so no risk, and actually, we just see um, always um, risks. Gunter. So, always. so no risks. Um, the person that asked, Mr. Anonymous, is actually um, uh, Rana from the Swedish perm rep uh, to the EU. I mean, so, so I mean, really, no risk of uh, of financial dominance, right? I mean, so, uh, so we are not. Um, not in a world where central banks really have to underwrite um, the non the the, the market-based financial system all the time, even if there's risks um, uh, to financial uh, to uh, to inflation. Well, there are risks to use you. There are risks, but small. But I think we're managing them in the right way. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. Governor, thank you. I thank you so much uh, for for your time today. Um, I, I think our hour is over. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion. Maria, perhaps uh, thank you also from on behalf of Maria de Merzis and myself. Um, it was great to have that opportunity uh, to discuss with you this very important issue of market-based financial intermediation and how to make sure that it's actually stable and whether macroprudential policy is the right thing to do. Thank you so much, Governor. Thank you Thank so you much, Governor. Thank you.